I can change this setting as well. Okay, it says that things are recording. I'm gonna move the screen like this. All right, can you still hear me and see me? Oh yeah. All right, excellent. Well, ladies and gentlemen, I would like to welcome a profound guest and someone that, man, that I really, really admire. Um, and was very excited that he accepted the invite to do an interview with Old Souls. And, you know, I'm still getting comfortable with saying Old Souls radio show or Old Souls interviews or just conversations. And I think that I'm, I'm more comfortable uh, just saying that this is a, it's a big conversation. And I'm hoping to add to the other conversations that are happening with these kinds of work. Um, so without further ado, I'd like to welcome uh, the one, the only, Dwayne Elgin. <laughs> <laughs> well, Roderick, Roderick, it's such a pleasure to be here with you. Oh, man, man likewise, <laughs> as, as I'm seeing with your praises often, man. Uh, <laughs> just a little background for the audience. The way that I came into connection with Dwayne was through a course that he offered uh, through Ubiquity University called Living in a Living Universe. And I won't go into all of what I just shared with him, how I came to during the, um, or producing the Old Souls, but Dwayne Elgin's course was, uh, I really credit him to helping to launch this, this uh, interview. And uh, with the things that we've talked about, and for those who maybe seen the previous interviews that I've had, we've talked about concepts from AI taking over in the next, 10 years to, um, I've had even some musicians on the show and just talking about the kinds of work that they do and how they're changing, you know, spiritual and their spiritual realities or what have you. Uh, but seeing the kinds of things that, again, that Dwayne talks about living in the living universe, man, this is a, a really expanded conversation that includes so many of the other things that I've talked about. And so, um, after taking this course, I did sense that this was 2017 was a launching year for me. And so I, he is one individual that I really wanted to be on the show um, because it just kind of helped to crystallize, if you will, the, the christen rather the show. So that's how we came into connection. So we'll, we'll jump right into it because his time is very limited. So Dwayne, tell us, man, who are you at this point of your life? Um, who are you, man? Tell us. Well, uh, to know who I am, you know, you have to know where I started. Yeah. And I, I grew up on a farm in Idaho. Wow. So if you want to know who I am, I'm a farm kid. I'm a farm boy. <laughs> I, did, I, I, I worked on a farm till I was 23. So yeah. it wasn't just teenage years. I, I really did work for a good part of my early years on a farm. Wow. And uh, even though I, I worked on a presidential commission, I worked... Um, uh, with future studies, with, with world-class scholars. But underneath that, if you really want to know, Rod, I'm just a farm kid. Oh. That's who I am. You, so. you know, Dwayne, believe it or not, my beginning year started off not so much living on the farm, but my grandparents had farms. And I used to live with them for a significant amount of years of my childhood. And that was my highlight as a child was to go to wow. my grandfather's hog form. Now he had many different forms, but he had a hog form. And my highlight was to go and feed the, the hogs slop. Yeah. <laughs> so, <laughs> so I, I connect with that part of you, man. That's, yeah. that's the nature part that I connect that's right. with. That's right. Yeah. Oh. There's, it's, there's humility there. there it's unpretentious that you don't, you don't dress up to go slop the hogs. You don't dress up to go <laughs> dig the ditches. You're just who you are. It's <laughs> real. <laughs> and I wouldn't be writing, I think, about a living universe had I not lived in that growing wow. up wow. Uh, with the animals, with, with nature around me. Uh, and it was just an, a presence that I, in, a, in effect, I took for granted. And um, my studies indicate roughly half uh, of the adult population has regular experiences where they would say, yeah, of course it's alive. Mm. Uh, of course it's a living uh, universe. How could it be otherwise? Um, 
the uh, the other half <laughs> will say you're crazy if you yeah. think it's a, if you think it's alive it's com dead at the foundations uh, you know it, it doesn't make sense and so there's really a divide between um communities that relate to the world in this deeper living uh, way they haven't had the instructions really many people yet to say these subtle experiences that you're having are actually very profound because those are, are the experiences you are having of your connection with a larger aliveness and when your aliveness connects with the aliveness of a living universe when life meets life the switch goes on and people have a mystical experience mm -hmm. they say this is Extraordinary. I'm, I'm at home finally. I feel at peace. I can rest now. Uh, there's love at the foundations of it all. And what has happened is simply relaxing into the cosmic nature that is already true. Mm -hmm. It's not manufacturing something. Mm -hmm. This is not to create, it's already present, but we haven't had a regular opportunity to develop a literacy of consciousness, if you right. will. Right. So, um, so your reflections, Rob. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, I'll tell you, man, and this was something that I was hoping to put in the, the script of questions. Um, but if you would allow me to go there, Dwayne. Please. It's, it's the Thrive documentary. Uh, is it considered a documentary? I'm not sure how to, to, to label it. But okay, I'm not sure. Okay. <laughs> I'll just go with documentary. You know, that documentary, one of the, you know, many things that you've been a part of, that is the thing that have been coming back to me. And it, it comes back to me more often than not, but this morning in particular, I was like, man, I wish I would have asked him about Thrive. But that's what, even that part of the, the conversation, um, I keep hearing Thrive. So could you just kind of talk about your contribution in the Throb documentary and how how that may have uh, maybe how's that making an impact with where you are now and I'm, I'm referring to like the tourists and those kinds of things yeah well uh, the documentary uh, was done years ago uh, maybe almost 10 years ago now oh, wow. a long time ago and uh, at least the portion that I contributed to mm -hmm. and then they started taking the uh the idea that the universe had, just to give the the viewers listeners mm -hmm. an understanding the universe has a purpose i think mm -hmm. if you look at the architecture of the universe rather than looking for um a, a series of concepts or a book of concepts what we can do is look at the designs in the universe, the, the structures of the universe. And what we see at every scale of the universe is what looks like a donut, if you will, a dynamic donut, a tornado, a self-organizing system mm -hmm. uh, where flows flow around themselves and hold themselves together just like a tornado does. And you can see this architecture throughout the universe. Mm -hmm. Now, that is the simplest geometry of a self-organizing system. Mm -hmm. And it means that the universe is doing something. It is creating self-organizing systems at every scale. And to be self-organizing, you have to be conscious mm -hmm. and you have to be reflective. Wow. And so that means that every scale of the universe at a primitive level, for sure, at the, at the more primal levels, uh, let's say the atomic, uh, there, but nonetheless, there is a centering consciousness, a capacity to be self-referencing and then to hold uh, that, let's say, an atomic structure, a molecular structure, and on, on up together. Mm -hmm. So the universe is busy building self-organizing systems. Mm -hmm. And if we want to be in accord with the universe, what we can do is say, well, how can we um, come together in a larger reflective self-organizing process where there's great freedom, great freedom, uh, and yet there is an ecology of interconnections. And so people recognize I have freedom, but it's freedom within the limits of the uh, ecology that's of the earth, the ecology of people and all the rest. But nonetheless, there's an immense amount of creative freedom and it arises not from a culture really fundamentally, but from the universe itself that wants our uh, expression. 
on its own uh, behalf. So let's see, I didn't, uh, so then Thrive, Thrive, what it had was 43 seconds of me describing <laughs> Tauruses, how we are a Taurus and we can meet center to center another person as a toroidal knowing and at the center a torus like just like a donut it's open mm -hmm. it's not closed like a circle it's open and that means at the very center of our being at the very center of our experience we are open to uh the the larger universe mm -hmm. um it just flows through and if you're sitting there open to the larger universe and I am, well, then we're instantly open to and recognizing uh, one another. It's as simple as that. Mm. Um, and we've all had that experience of instant recognition of another soul. Oh, yes, I've seen you before. Mm -hmm. and so on. Uh, we know this. This is uh, widely uh, appreciated. So uh, that's what Thrive uh, as a documentary uh, affirmed. It was that kind of toroidal uh, uh, geometry in the universe and connectivity. Uh, what Thrive didn't do in my regard uh, was appreciate, for example, how serious the global climate crisis mm -hmm. is. Uh, and instead steered people into the, the notion that uh, what we have is a um, conspiracy by the elites uh, to uh, control the world, if you will. Mm -hmm. Now, there, I, I think there may be some truth to that, but I don't think we have enough um, uh, competency to, to, to create the level of conspiracy that that movie presents. Mm -hmm. And so I publicly disavowed a connection with the film, uh, as did a number of people, uh, because what they denied, like climate change, is so serious, we, we, it must be honored, it must be uh, brought into our collective uh, uh, considerations. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And speaking of the climate change, Dwayne, you being someone who's grown up um, as a farm young man, a farm boy, um, and I may be jumping ahead of myself, but we'll go with it. Let's go. You, know, you now living, and I hope I'm making the right uh, assumption, you're living in, the, in an eco valley, uh, uh, eco village. Is that what it's called? I, I, my wife and I did live in an okay. eco village maybe 10 years ago, okay. for several years, <clears throat> but we were renters. We've always been renters, and they sold uh, our unit, okay. and we had to move. So, uh, but it was a wonderful experience, and uh, it really gave me a, a grounding in speaking about eco-village living. Well, and being a part of that kind of community, and, and again, including your background uh, working with nature, how much have you seen in your lifetime um, the impacts of the climate change and some of the things that we're doing as a global community to accelerate some of the changes that are happening? happening yeah uh well growing up on a farm what i appreciate is the vulnerability of crops mm -hmm. and i could just go down a list of uh, vulnerabilities but uh, for example if you're growing wheat mm -hmm. and uh the crop is just ready to harvest and the combines are coming in tomorrow to to harvest the wheat and yet a little summer or a little, yeah, a little summer rain comes over, sprinkles a little rain on the wheat. It's just enough rain that the wheat falls over. Within 24 hours, it's rotting. It can't be harvested. Mm. I've seen that happen. In uh, 24 hours. <laughs> oh, yeah, it starts rotting immediately. And then uh, if portions of the field are fa have fallen down, uh, that compromises the integrity of the whole field. Mm. Or, or you have a, a, a little... Uh, rainstorm that comes over your cherry trees and water falls on the cherries and maybe 10% of the cherries absorb the water and they're ready to harvest and they split open. And then the, uh, the, the place that's buying your cherries says, you know, we can't take these. Maybe we can use the fruit juice because 10% are split open. But you say 90% are good, but they say we can't afford to, uh, to call out the 10% that are bad. Mm -hmm. 
Mm. So you see what I'm saying? It, it just takes a little bit of variability in the climate and you're in trouble uh, as a farmer. And so then you ask, well, what is the first thing that is happening with global warming? Mm -hmm. It's variability. It's not simply that it's either warmer uh, or cooler. It is the extremes and it's more uh, unpredictable and it's more variable. And that's the last thing you want as a farmer. Well, that's what's happening. Mm -hmm. At the same time that uh, is happening, um, world population that is growing, that's relying upon the predictability of that agriculture to feed them. Mm -hmm. So when I was born, there were 2.2 billion people on the planet, 2.2. Now they're about seven and a half billion uh, on the planet, which means that the number of people on the planet have more than tripled mm -hmm. already mm -hmm. in my lifetime. Uh, so you can see where this is going. Uh, the number of people on the planet is exploding at the same time that the capacity uh, to, to produce the food, uh, given the uh, change in climate, is declining. Mm -hmm. And there are other factors to weave into this, but that's a simple description of how something that I am seeing, uh, a collision that we're just not paying attention to. Um, and I could see something, let me, it's very specific. Um, I was doing research uh, in the 70s for like the president's science advisor. Mm -hmm. And one of the studies we did was to look at critical global problems that could wipe us out from the blind side, problems that we just weren't paying attention to. Mm -hmm. So in 1975, I went to a briefing at the Department of Energy in Washington where they spoke about uh, climate change as specifically as a global problem that was going to emerge in the future. And they said, in 40 to 50 years, this is going to be a serious global problem unless political action and then economic action is taken to remedy it. And so we said, well, look, we're doing this study for the science advisor to, to alert the president to, to uh, challenges in the future. And the, they said, don't include it. It's so far into the future, 40 wow. or 50 years into the future. Uh, it's so far, uh, there's plenty of time to respond uh, to this, to handle this. Well, that was uh, 42 years ago. Wow. That was 42 years ago. Um, so um, I'm worried. I'm genuinely worried, uh, not that we couldn't do this. We, I think we definitely can. Uh, but rather, I don't know that we have the social will uh, to mobilize ourselves to actually take the kind of action that's, that's essential. So, and that's a lot. Let me, let me make sure that I'm, I'm with you. Um, let me go back to the, the analogy or illustration that you gave with the cherry trees and the wheat. Um, if I understood you, this has been a, we can say, a, a, an influence or a correlation to the climate change that the weather patterns or not just the weather patterns, but the, the rain itself has become, I don't know if, if acidic is the best word or I'm not sure how to describe what happened with the mist and the rain um, within the recent years as opposed to maybe 30, 40, 50 years ago. And so how would, how would you describe what's happening? Is it, is it acids in the rains that are causing the a vegetation to, to respond in the way that, it, that you've seen that it has? Well, uh, certainly uh, acidification is present. It's there in the oceans. It's, uh, it's like carbon, you know, the carbon dioxide is uh, dissolving mm. uh, a number of shellfish in the ocean. It's dissolving some of the coral reefs. Uh, that same acidification that we see in the oceans is present, obviously, in the rain and the atmosphere. And what we're seeing, for example, in older cities like in Europe, maybe there in China, is uh, ancient uh, and pr previously well-preserved uh, uh, cities uh, are now uh, being eroded through this corrosion uh, of the uh, acid-like uh, mm -hmm. uh, water. So... Um, Nonetheless, here's what I'm seeing mm -hmm. that, uh, that I think is going to be extraordinarily uh, problematic. And that is um, 
long before we melt the ice caps. And I think it looks like we are going to melt uh, the ice caps. We're going to have sea level rise. It's going to flood uh, a number of seacoast cities, very important cities around the world. But before we do that, we are going to experience, I think, sufficient climate fluctuations mm -hmm. in a context of, um, of a compromised climate in the mid regions of the planet. And there's the expectations that upwards of 2 billion people, 2 billion people will be migrating into resource favored areas by the end of the century. Wow. Now, if, if there are 2 billion people migrating and they are migrating for good reason because there's not the food and the resources in, in the climate challenged regions to support them, they're leaving for survival. Okay, now as we've already seen what uh, millions of people do uh, moving out of Syria and such into uh, Europe, it mm -hmm. is uh, un unraveling the civic structure there. What happens when two billion people are on the move? Mm -hmm. uh, I think it's going to be a shattering experience for uh, humanity in terms of our, our identity. Who are we? Mm -hmm. uh, if our ethnic culture, uh, the racial heritage that we have, the religious heritage and all the rest is just obliterated, just shattered, the institutional structure shattered, um, and, and meaning shattered. What is the meaning of all of this? Now, unless there is a larger perspective and story of what's going on here, it's very um, understandable. People would say, uh, you know, this is uh, as good as it gets. It's never getting better, and it's all downhill from here, uh, and, so, and on and on and on, uh, to take a very dismal view of the future and to veer off into a new uh, dark age. So mm -hmm. these are very vulnerable times, and key, I feel, to a promising future is our simple stories of the future. Simple stories of the future. And um, the American dream, so-called, has become the world's nightmare. Mm -hmm. uh, that story is killing, literally, it is literally uh, of consumerism and materialism and profit above all else. That is killing the planet. Uh, so it, it's literally true to say that um, the American dream is uh, the world's nightmare. We need a new dream. <laughs> and more than a dream, we need to be wide awake this time, wide awake, and choose consciously where we're going. And that's why I write about learning to live in a living universe. It isn't a dead universe that we want to exploit. It's a living universe that we want to bring a sacred uh, regard to. So um, this is a pivotal shift uh, I see in humanity's evolutionary journey. Uh, for the last 50,000 years, we've been on a journey of separation uh, in different ways, separation from nature, from one another. And that was purposeful. And we were individuating, uh, differentiating ourselves, empowering ourselves. Mm -hmm. But now we've taken it just as far as we can and we need to turn back home. And uh, home is the living universe that we left long ago, and now we need to reclaim uh, our participation in that living universe without losing uh, everything that we've gained in the process. Mm -hmm. uh, the awakening that we've gained and the, the skills, the talents that we've gained, and, and so on. So um, it's the return home, but uh, with, with the gifts already gained. Absolutely, man. Beautifully stated, man. Beautifully stated. Could, could you, I think it was in your book. Um, I feel like I've read so many books these last, I don't know, man, this last <laughs> year. I'm like, somebody said this. <laughs> yes, somebody. But, but I'm going to go back to your statement about the American dream uh, being the really American nightmare now. I mean, really the world's nightmare. The world's, yeah. Um, was it you that gave a statistic about middle class and um i'm gonna do my best to remember it i'm gonna have to just uh, paraphrase it but <laughs> something about how if we continued with the same consumption level as a middle class that in the next five to ten, not five to ten years but in some radical number 15 to 20 years whatever it was that we would deplete and accelerate 
certain changes in some kind of drastic way. That's the best that I can do to remember that. <laughs> there was something about middle class, yes. middle class consumption. Could you clarify that for me, please? Yeah. Well, uh, actually, see, we've already gotten there. Uh, we've already, over, it's overshoot and collapse is the, is the challenge, simplifying it. If we, if we overshoot, if we consume too much uh, from the oceans, too much from the land, too much from, from the rivers, and, and I don't know, if we, just, if we overconsume the regenerative capacity of the earth, beyond which year to year it can, it can okay, new fish, okay, new, tr new trees, okay, new whatever, <clears throat> If we consume beyond the regenerative capacity of the earth, which we're now doing, uh, then at some point it creates an impossible situation. And <clears throat> we can already see the impossible situation because we're drawing down on uh, old resources, things that are already in the ground, the oil and, and, and the old growth trees and all the rest. So we're drawing upon resources that won't be there once they are consumed. So uh, we're already in overshoot for, to a considerable uh, degree. And uh, collapse then comes, or transformation, when overshoot reaches an impossible uh, limit. And my sense is it's going to reach uh, an impossible limit within the next, say, 10 to 15 years. Mm -hmm. uh, because it's already there, it cannot be regenerated. We are already uh, in overshoot. Uh, what we need to recognize is that we're already in a compromised, dangerously compromised situation, far more dangerous than we realize. Uh, and we need genuinely to pull together, work together as a human community uh, to transform this or we're, we're going down. Uh, we're, going to, we're going to create a, by our own hand, uh, a human um, a world that's, that's completely un inhospitable to human civilization. This is, these are serious uh, choices we're making now. Well, Dwayne, I'm, I'm going to make a suggestion. You tell me what you think. I think that the developed world um, needs to go on a food and water fast for about Two weeks. Do you think that'll help to solve some of our problems? <laughs> and not just food and water, man. I think the consumption level in terms of materialism, I think that we can just not have for more than two weeks, you know, and we would still be okay with, with what we currently purchase. That's a suggestion, man. <laughs> oh, that sounds pretty radical, Rad. Rad, it's got, <clears throat> you got to write a book on uh, simple living or something like that. I, what would you call it? Maybe voluntary simplicity? You got to try that. Yeah. I mean, I'll, I'll do an extension of your work. Man. <laughs> I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm going to be yeah. on the more radical side of the ways. I'm going to suggest a three week fast, no food, no anything. We, yeah. just, we go connect put with it, nature. Put, put it down. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, I, I say that um, with, with some humor, but I've, I've read here recently somewhere, again, someone said that if we were just to, oh, it was the uh, documentary of What the Health. Have you seen it? Uh, no, I haven't. Okay. Maybe you would, you know, find some, some interest in it, but it, it, it's, you know, it, it's politically pushing veganism and all those kinds of things. But this is one of the documentaries where I've heard um that if we just didn't eat for one day or even half of a day or didn't eat meat or something like that for, for one very short period how much that would make a very radical change in our country or in in the Dramatic. world in the world dramatic and you just know, started. I, yes you know, i'm assuming you know in my very comical way that man I couldn't even imagine if it, if it was just half of a day that a country decided, hey, we're not going to purchase or consume any meat for just this time. I could only imagine the drastic changes that could occur if it was, you know, for three days or for a week or for two weeks. Man, what kind of radical changes that could possibly make? Am I living in a pipe dream? Possibly, I know. But, you know, just to kind of play with those ideas and concepts, you know, oh, give it that make, very make a movie. Make a, <laughs> make a, what if you made a three-minute movie, a documentary, and it was a science fiction documentary, and, and the world heard you, you gave the pitch, uh, and the world heard you and turned off the TV and went on a fast or a good portion. 
and you could just play it out in two or three minutes. I know you could. It, Dwayne, I appreciate that, man. And you're, you're, you're helping me with this <laughs> interview in so many ways, man. You don't even know because um, in these last, I guess this last, uh, this next half of the interview, you're bringing me to some of the concepts that you even describe in your book, or at least the portion of the book that I recently read. Um, when we talk about like the impact that media has, and you being you know a part of the media of uh, making an impact in the media for man for more than a few decades, how have you seen? how media has really accelerated some of the changes that we desire to see. We know how media has some negative impacts, irrespectful of, I know the academic world, we hate to use the word, it has a direct impact, that it has to you know, use very passive terms to talk about impacts. But how have you seen um, how media can be used in a way to make the kinds of changes that we um, who are aware and, and those who are growing to be aware of the times that we're living in. Hopefully yeah. that question made sense. Yeah. Um, you, you, as I hear your question, Rod, um, I hear a question about the role of uh, the mass media mm -hmm. in our mass mind. Mm -hmm. And it's mm -hmm. a direct connection, uh, as I see it. And I've, I've sat for years in meditation. And, uh, and I walked away then to ask, well, what is the social equivalent of me sitting there on the cushion meditating? Mm -hmm. What's the social equivalent of that? Um, and when I'm meditating, uh, initially what I'm doing, I'm just watching, I'm paying attention, I'm observing. So where is the social observer? Uh, where is the vehicle of collective attention? Uh, where do we turn to for collective observation or attention? Well, it's, it has been television. Actually, it still is. Mm -hmm. um, uh, the internet is, is growing. Uh, it's still not dominant over television. And the internet is very fragmented. Um, so television is shallow, but it's actually uh, coherent and brings together large communities of people. The internet goes very deep, but it's very, is very fragmented. And actually, if we bring those two together, what we have is the makings of a revolution mm -hmm. uh, that still hasn't been realized. Wow. Uh, uh, television and the internet. And the reason it hasn't been realized is because uh, the public has been distracted. Um, we assume that other people own the airwaves, other people own the television networks, that we can't do anything about it. And yet the most fundamental right uh, as a citizen of this earth, I feel, is to use the public airwaves for public discourse about our public future. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. our future. And so uh, we own the airwaves just like we own uh, uh, the physical air that we breathe. Mm -hmm. uh, it's a part of the collective commons and we collectively care about it. Now, um, as soon as we want, uh, we can have a local to national to global electronic town meetings where we come together in conversation at the local scale. We put one together in the San Francisco Bay Area, seen by over 300,000 people wow, in, wow. in 1987. 1987, uh, this is 30 years ago. Mm. Uh, we, we had a Bay Area primetime electronic town meeting. It was seen uh, by over 300,000, over, over, well, nearly 500 people were voting. And we had six votes during the, uh, the hour uh, from the scientific sample. And so we demonstrated the ability of a scientific sample of citizens to, to vote again and again and again on, a, on a, a compelling issue, in this case, attitudes towards Russia. Mm -hmm. uh, this is back in 1987. Wow. Uh -huh. So uh, we can do this. Um, now we have the Internet. Then we only had telephones. So my point being, if we want to now, right now, 51% of the people on this earth have access to the internet. We are a wired world. And if we want to talk to one another as a, a global public, we have the technological means to do so. So um, we're on the verge of a new level of uh, global empowerment. I think a new superpower is emerging 
with the uh, empowerment of ordinary citizens to use to use their cell phones and vote mm -hmm. and to say, uh, yes, I want a voice in humanity's future. Uh, yes, I want a strong and a fair climate action now, uh, whatever it is. Uh, and around the world, we can, we can register the fact that not only are we citizens of the United States or China or wherever, we're citizens of the earth as right. well. Right. Uh, uh, it, no problem. We're citizens of both. And just like I'm a c citizen of California as well. Um, so uh, we, we can uh, bring our mature sense of regard for the well-being of the earth into that, uh, that new feedback process. And that provides a context then for nation states and other powers within the global frame to say, you know, there's a larger framework that's watching me, that's paying attention to how uh, the whole uh, global configuration is working and, and the people are saying, this is not working. Mm -hmm. We need to shift in a more promising direction like this or whatever. Mm -hmm. uh, I basically, I trust uh, ordinary people. I grew up on a farm. I trust ordinary, <laughs> ordinary people. Um, I do. And uh, so let's give the people of the earth a chance to voice their wisdom. Because they're old souls. There are a huge number of old souls out there. With I believe huge, it, man. Huge amount of wisdom. Give them a chance to, uh, to reflect and give feedback. Okay, that's my soapbox. Okay. <laughs> no, Your turn. Right. no, man, I, I think that I that's... <laughs> that quote unquote soapbox, man, I, I love it because it, it, it took me back to a conversation that we had in my, um, one of my master's classes, one of my master's communication classes for mass communication. Um, at that time, I didn't realize how much of the world that didn't have access to the internet, but over the, the last maybe five years or so, four or five years, I've thought about, I um, mean, maybe even, maybe there was something that was said during that class that, that helped me to form this thought. But to consider once we have the very remote areas or the places that has no quote unquote significance on a map, um, these very primitive communities, once these places have access to the internet, and when we talk about the mass conversation, I love the concept of uh, mass mind, by the way, but I'll come back there. But when I think about the mass mind and, and the mass uh, community, global community that has a chance to partake in the conversation and to contribute their piece to transformation, how we need to transform and to draw up some of those ancient ways and old ways and and in, in their world, contemporary, contemporary ways, because this is still their current lifestyle. I mean, in our minds, yeah. we we'll say, oh, well, that's, you know, the old way of doing things, but they're very rooted in their lifestyle. And they, and they have the kinds of, quote unquote, scientific evidence and proof that may not, they may not use the same tools that a developed country use, but they have their own methodologies that they use to help uh, preserve their communities. And so... What am I trying to say? I'm, I'm just saying that, you know, as you, you've inspired me, one, but as I think about these larger conversations and trusting the people and adding to the voices that will contribute to the kinds of changes that we need to see, I think that um, the more hopeful side is that we're going to see uh, a particular map that will unfold in a way that for maybe right now it, it's unimaginable because there's so many other pieces that need to come together and what i mean by pieces people that as we unite as a people and as we see more people being able to participate in this change that may not think the way that we think or may not have the kinds of resources that that we have but mentally uh in that mass mind the collective mind there's, you know, parts of the brains that may seem very insignificant, but man, if you just shift it in one particular way, man, it sets everything off, right? Yeah. <laughs> so that's my, my response to, to, to what you just shared. 
which I, I am going to segue, man, and I know my time is starting to wrap up here, but I want you to kind of speak to your ideas about the virtual world and what does that mean in terms of, um, I even make the connection with meditation. What does that mean in terms of shifting our consciousness in a way that may be saying something more on the subconscious levels about who we are and what, where we are growing to? I'm going to make this statement and I'm going to turn it over to you. In one of my previous interviews with Shelly Alcorn, um, we had a segment where we focused on redefining what it means to be human, especially in light of technological advancements and automations and again, artificial intelligence and consciousness and all these kinds of things. Um, I think we kind of touched on virtu the virtual world, but I'm somewhat feel like I'm channeling part of that conversation and bringing it here when we, we talk about the virtual world and what does that mean for the human shift that's happening. I'm going to turn it over to yeah. you. Hopefully that, that has some, some sense and you can, you can it, play with that and do some It better. does, uh, Ron. Um, it's, the, what's going on right now is very complex, intertwined, and it goes, uh, it includes artificial intelligence uh, as well as uh, virtual reality, as well as genetic engineering. Mm -hmm. uh, and what we're, we're, going, we're already seeing is the convergence of all of those. And uh, communities of people that say, well, I'm a biological being, but I, we're on the verge of being able to radically uh, change through a genetic, a gene editing technology, uh, our genetic, genetic structure. Um, with the aid of uh, uh, advanced technology, augmented uh, reality and such, we can change how we see and, and understand the world out there. With virtual reality, we can enter into immersive experiences and it begins to shift uh, our sense of um, secure, confident connection with mm. the world around us and begin to see, well, maybe, uh, maybe Elon Musk, who says uh, there's only one chance in a billion, this is actual real reality. Mm. I think this is, is true reality. <clears throat> this is the base reality. And uh, that's a question that's up for humanity. What is the nature of the universe that we're living within. And so virtual reality, because it loosens our uh, solid connections with um, the physical world, it, it invites us and then to <clears throat> explore the non-physical world that, that holds it, that contains it. And so it actually opens us into other worlds as well as the worlds behind it, as well as the idea that we're living in a hologram. Uh, it's being continuously created, created, created. Now, if you think about uh, what that means is in the world of history, I started off with a feeling of others. I'm here, someone else is there. Uh, my basic founding premise is a world of others. Mm -hmm. uh, the, and the world's golden rule, do unto others. It's others all over the place. Mm -hmm. This starts with the unity. It says, wow. well, the universe is a unified whole moment by moment by moment. You're a part of that a hologram and that you're just getting recreated along with everything else. And you're a part of the whole cosmos because you're a part of the hologram. Now it turns out the physical part of the hologram is only 4%. And this is well established now by science. 96% of the cosmic hologram is invisible. Mm. And we used to think that anything invisible, if you couldn't touch it with your senses, it was not real. Now they're saying 96% of what is real, you can't touch with your senses. Mm. It radically is changing how we regard the nature of reality itself. Um, and it isn't just a small uh, change. It's saying 96% is wow. that which cannot be touched with your senses. Um, so I'm saying, look, we're biocosmic. We're biological. That's 4%. We're also a part of the universe. So 96% of ourselves at least is extended out uh, into the larger ecology of the universe. So what's the job here? Well, we're trying to become self-centering, self-organizing, self-reflective. In other words, we're trying to learn 
how to live in the deep ecology of a living universe. Mm. What an amazing uh, project for humanity. What mm -hmm. an extraordinary project. And it does not negate any of the world's religions. Mm -hmm. Every one of the world's religions has an experiential grounding in regarding the universe as a living regenerative system. Mm -hmm. So if you're looking for common ground among the world's uh, spiritual traditions, this is a, a, a core place of common ground to say, well, it's, I'm not sure about uh, this teaching or that teaching, but we all agree that the universe is a holographic regenerative system, however described, uh, and we're, we're participating in that. And so we are biocosmic beings by our very nature. And what we're trying to do is to learn how to live ethically, creatively, purposefully, consciously, lovingly uh, in a living universe. Mm, 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 mm. Man, <laughs> you know, there's, I wish we had more time, Dwayne. I do, and I know we have 10 minutes, and I'm saying it as if the interview is over, and it's not. I'm going to get every drop out of this last few minutes. <laughs> there was so much that you said there. Let me, let me, let me go back because I, I want Please. to ask you about, um, man, I, okay, let me start here. Virtual reality, VR, artificial meditation. Okay, I'm gonna put it in those kind yeah. of contexts. Yeah. What do you think about that? Do you think that virtual reality is an artificial meditation? Um, especially when we think about our sleep dream time. And, you know, it's been suggested, research suggests that left side of the brain goes asleep, I mean, uh, relaxes as the right side of the brain takes the forefront, if you will, of just kind of dreams. There's no boundary, so to speak, our logical yeah. No, you can't do this and you know blah blah blah, blah. but dream world give uh, gives us these abilities to fly or to enter into other That's right. so to speak and essentially vr is offering this in a what it seems to be a more organized way because you know it's still logical in some ways but as you mentioned it frees up some space for us to feel like possibility yes you know, what yeah. seemed impossible now it, it's possible for me to to experience this What's your thoughts about maybe cultivating meditation in a way to produce some of the, I'm going to make the assumptions that VR is, it is literally shifting the brains. It's reshaping the brain in a way yes. to, to think in, in a particular way. What's yes. your thoughts about that? Talk oh, absolutely. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, no I, I totally agree that uh, if, for example, if I decide in virtual reality space, I can fly mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And, uh, and I just soar. Um, well, why not? If I can do that in VR space, then maybe I can do it in my imagination. Maybe then someone comes along and says, you know, how about remote viewing? How about letting your consciousness fly to another place, to, to your home or to a loved one and so on, and be present uh, mm -hmm. with that? to the world that you care about and so on. And, and what we're learning then is, oh, okay, well, I could do that with myself. Maybe let me open in, in that felt way that I've already experienced through VR experience into uh, the experiential space uh, of connecting with a person, a place, and so on. So I think there is uh, important uh, training uh, and we're using technologies now to gain this new literacy of consciousness. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, now, here's the, here's the challenge that I see. It is that there is a community of people that are very, very wealthy that are saying, uh, we can use genetic uh, engineering to enhance within a single generation or two uh, our intelligence and, and other capacities, radically enhance. Uh, who we are uh, and what we're capable of. Um, and we can further, we can enhance that with um, artificial intelligence, uh, maybe neural inter interlacing with virtual reality and so on. There, it's, it's just exploding in terms of the technologies. My concern is that we're going to have a, uh, a, a superhuman emerge 
within one to two generations. Uh, someone that um, has been genetically engineered to, to have super normal capacities, let's say an IQ of 200 instead of 100, and maybe a, a handful of people like that. And right away in a context of, um, of great necessity and um, opportunity, someone like that with an intelligence of say 200 could become a very dominant person and um, irreplaceable. Mm -hmm. uh, and unstoppable. And what we could do is unleash through genetic engineering and, all, and artificial intelligence and, and, and VR, throw that in, uh, a track of human development that is so biologically based mm -hmm. that it doesn't recognize we're biocosmic in nature. Mm -hmm. And other people are saying, wait, no, we're, we're trying, we only live here for a short while. We don't have a long time here. Mm -hmm. And rather than try to uh, prop up our biology, we're, our, our body is a biodegradable vehicle for acquiring these soul growing experiences. Mm -hmm. Let's grow the soul. Let's grow the aliveness. Aliveness is their only true wealth. Mm -hmm. Let's grow that wealth. So uh, there's going to be a community that says, Thank you, but I know where my priorities are, and they are in growing my deeper, soulful, old soul aliveness. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And so I think we are going to see two powerful cultures emerge in the next few generations um, based on deep spiritual practice and based upon deep uh, techno genetic engineering and all the rest. And we're going to have a real challenge integrating the, um, what comes out of this. Mm -hmm. you, you know, and oh my gosh, I'm, I'm really fascinated with Ray Kurz, Kurzweil, 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 always yeah. Kurzweil, thank you. I'm really fascinated yeah. with his work as controversial as he is. You sure. know, we've seen many of his predictions that have, in terms of technology, that it has, it's manifested in, in very, 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 very significant ways. And to think about, you know, something that you didn't quite say, but I felt that it was alluding to, I mean, his ideas about death and how it shatters many of the traditional mindsets of we're preparing for this time of death, et cetera, et cetera, where he's extending. I mean, he's focusing on let's extend this. What, Heck, why do we have to die? Let's think about ways to avoid this, <laughs> you know, this, this thing that we call death. And when we throw in the ideas of technology and how technology, I don't know who said this. Again, I, I'm in a place where somebody said it. Um, but it was, we are in a place that we cannot, we can't truly say, we can't use the past to vision what the future will be like. I mean, it's, it's right. not indicative as it was, not that it ever has been. I mean, we only have the present as, as some believe. Um, but I think that at least, you know, 30 years ago, 20 years ago, we could somewhat imagine, okay, in the next 10 years, this is what our plan is going to look like in the next 30 years, maybe 50 <laughs> years. But given the acceleration of technology, we don't have it right now. That's okay, right. I have about two minutes, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna. We, we, that'll be something, man. I hope we can come back to. You had a statement in the book um, that, man, it, it was simple, but it really inspired me. And I think it may have been was it Mother Teresa, or one of the saints, or someone had made a yeah. statement about God is on the journey as well. Something yeah. perspective, man, yeah. that melted in my heart like in, in such a special way. Yeah. Uh, what does that mean to you? It means that uh, the, uh, there's our universe, and, but our universe is fairly young. It was born almost 14 billion years ago. That's a long time, but it's still in the larger scale of things not that long ago. Our universe came from somewhere. And uh, scientists call it the meta universe, and I call it the mother universe. And I think there's a mother universe that is giving birth to all of these daughter universes and our universe is one of them. And within, uh, Plato said, uh, the universe is a single living creature that contains all living creatures within it. And so here we are, a living creature within a living universe. And so what we're doing is becoming uh, reflective enough, aware enough that we can look back at the universe and say, wow, 
This is an amazing place. Um, what has been created here? And then we are then on a, in a process of discovery of learning how to live here. And once we learn how to live here, we have learned the basic skill sets for then moving into the deep ecology. Uh, of a living universe beyond the three dimensions. We're only a couple of dimensions above a black hole. We're just crawling out of a black hole. We're just getting started. Uh, scientists say we're in a universe of infinite dimensionality. Mm. So, um, uh, you know, the American Indians speak about three miracles. Uh, the first miracle is that anything exists at all. Anything exists at all. Second miracle is that living things exist, uh, plants and animals. Uh, and the third uh, miracle is that living things exist that know they exist. And that is essentially ourselves, uh, beings with a reflective consciousness. We know that we're here. Um, yeah, we can turn that mirror of knowing back on, upon ourselves. Now, what's happened is that we've become so enamored with ourselves like, oh, aren't we amazing? That we have forgotten the first miracle, mm. that there's anything here at all. Wow. Mm -hmm. And so what we're doing now is recovering the first miracle. And the first miracle, we're saying, hey, it, it's alive. It, we thought it was alive early on, but then we went into a time of when we said, no, we'll, we'll consider it dead, but now we're recovering it's aliveness and we're using the, the the tools of science to cut away superstition and reveal yeah it's actually has the attributes of a living system and then also for the very first time we're seeing the democratization of the world's spiritual traditions and we're seeing there's an experiential source uh, regarding the nature of the universe in all of them all of them uh, in, and we could take time some time to go through tradition by tradition and how they language uh, a universe that's regenerative, that's creative, that's arising freshly at every moment. Uh, it's an extraordinary uh, understanding that's now emerging through the uh, uh, world's wisdom tradition. So we put the, that together with science and then we see then uh, back the uh, recovery, the first miracle uh, that anything is here at all is truly a miracle that's happening moment by moment by moment. Mm -hmm. Wow, man. Okay, this will kind of be my final question, man. Uh, <laughs> you give me so much that I just want to dig open and, <laughs> and, and take it apart. Co-creation. Yes. What has been your, um, I guess I'll say your greatest achievement in terms of co-creation. You talk about co-creating with the universe and um, some of the illusions, you know, to, not illusion, excuse me, uh, the ideas of, you know, the all, the God. What, what do you feel has been your greatest achievement so far in co-creation? Uh, now, look, that's like asking a farmer. <laughs> You, you, you were out there, you were throwing a whole bunch of seeds around. <laughs> you were hoping for a good crop out there. Right. And now tell me, tell me how did the crop turn out? Well, I don't know, Rod. I know. know it's a big question, but I got to <laughs> ask him. If, if, you, if you could think of one thing, I know that there's many. I do, and I know it's a big question for you. I know it is. But if you had yeah. to answer, what would you yeah. say? I would say... Um, exactly uh, where all of this has, has led me over the, all these many years um, into that one summary sentence. Uh, we, are, we are biocosmic beings. I mean that, bio, we're both bio and cosmic, who are learning to live in a living universe. And it's a learning process. It isn't just plop down there, we have to learn our way into this. And in our learning in a context of great freedom, we are then acquiring at a soulful level, at a soulful level, at the level of light, love, music, and knowing at the inner soulful level, we're acquiring the skills for living in the deep ecology of a living universe. And I think that's what all of the world's uh, wisdom traditions uh, were about. Who are you? Uh, uh, recognize yourself. Uh, while you're here, while you have these pre these precious years here, recognize who you are, grow the aliveness. 
Grow the light, the luminosity. Go, grow the love, the caring, the compassion. Uh, grow the knowing, the consciousness. Uh, grow, the, uh, grow that because you won't have long. You won't have long. Uh, so um, I think if anything, uh, what I have contributed is a sense of let's, let's be clear about priorities. It isn't let's voluntarily maybe cut back on consumerism and turn the dial up on uh, compassion, love, and uh, engagement with the uh, aliveness of the, uh, of the universe. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, I started the interview. I don't know if it was before we recorded or right at the beginning, but I asked you for some wisdom for a man who just turned 34 last week. And I think you just accomplished that, man. Oh. That, that, that right there was gold to me. That's <laughs> something I can feed on for the rest of my life. So thank All you right. very much. Uh, uh, where can people reach you? Uh, they can go to my website, uh, DwayneElgin.com, and it's D-U-A-N-E-E-L-G-I-N.com. And there's a, a free book on the front homepage. There's free articles. And, and it's really a resource for, um, for transformation. Wow. And I will attest, transformation, it, it does. Um, I had something so good to say. It just all got <laughs> fragmented. Transformation you shall experience, man. After to after reading his his book, his materials, and watching more than a few of his videos and conversations. So, Dwayne, thank you very much for your time, man. It has right, been thank you precious, precious. Yeah, and I'm precious. hoping that we can do it. Okay, man. I appreciate. It. Hope we can do this again, man. At some time. Let's do. Let's okay. do. All right, man. Okay. God bless. Take care. You. Okay, you too. Bye. Bye bye.